The following lore is from TD Era and is an introduction to a new race on the Roleplay forums. We also now have a Patreon for those who are interested in donating. We have six different tiers with a multitude of benefits. All proceeds go to my construction crew, advertisements, and any necessities that we may need to continue on the project. For more information, check the Patreon link in the description below. These videos mention uncomfortable themes such as blood, homelessness, racism, abuse of power, branding, torture, second class treatment, war, death, assassination, shunning, public shaming, forced labor, violence, and imprisonment. Viewer discretion is advised. The average height of an arch room ranges somewhere between 5 foot 2 inches to 5 foot 6 inches. Some arch rooms remain around 4 foot 10 inches, regardless of age. They don't grow any more than that. But there are also artroons that are freakishly tall, some as tall as 6 foot 5. Their skin color ranges from a pale peach to a very dark chocolate in color. Artroons are average magic users. There are some specifically gifted that can use powerful magic, but most prefer to stick with magic that is easier to master and won't potentially kill them if they use it too much. Race exclusive magic for the artroon are blood mages, those who can use and manipulate their own blood and sometimes others. With this, they can always have a weapon on hand without needing needing to carry one physically, and this weapon can change forms day to day. The average lifespan of the Artroon race is around 79 years of age. Depending on how well the Artroon takes care of themselves using regular exercise and eating healthy foods, they could possibly live longer, even around 100 or more years. Riders and dragons, should they find their partner, can live eternally unless mortally wounded and killed regardless of their race's lifespans. There are four total Artroon cities. However, one has been completely abandoned due to the great magical storm caused by war between it and the nearby Muayan city and has thus been left in ruin. Jelene Sand is a vast city with a mixture of Artroon ranging from incredibly wealthy and living what looks like palaces to dirt poor and living on the streets. The entrances from the desert to the city are quite plain with many earth tone colored box like buildings. These buildings often have thatched roofs made of straw or leaves, or if the family inside has enough wealth, clay parapet roofing. Further into the city is a rundown looking marketplace. Many of the booths are made of wood with a cloth gable roof, held up by a single beam jutting out of the ground in the middle of the booth. It's always very crowded here, and thieves are quite common. The deeper in the city you go, the more exotic the architecture becomes. The buildings start to become more colorful, especially the rooftops. The roofing architecture is a mixture of domes and cupolas, with many open archways and long extravagant curtains hiding the rooms behind them. There are many gardens lining the courtyards and surrounding big, beautiful fountains. Birds of many sizes and colors like to flock to this area of the city, so wildlife is abundant. Kai Kareg is surrounded by large stone walls with turrets and a walkway connecting each of them, surrounded by parapets. Inside the city, most of the buildings are built from red brick and slate roofs that are in the cross gable architectural style. Many of these buildings have beautiful gardens, whether they are businesses or homes, with creeping vines lining the walls. Some buildings sport turrets and small towers, usually meant for studies or small bedrooms. They also have stone brick roads for carts and carriages. There's a small park-like area with a gazebo, benches, and a beautiful fountain. And the dead center of the city is a mansion surrounded by gardens on all sides with multiple fountains, ponds, and even its own personal gazebo and weeping willows. Sunge Kalopa is a small but tranquil village nestled between two cliffs. There are a multitude of waterways circling the buildings, resulting in a lot of bridges being built to help people get from place to place on foot, and many small boats to transport one to two people at a time as a shortcut. The buildings themselves are mostly made of wood and bear curvy, elongated roofs with golden statues as decor. Some of the inner walls of the houses and businesses would consist of wooden frames with translucent paper, often used as sliding doors. Sometimes the outside of the building, usually if the building has a veranda, will have these as well. But what the city is most known for is its year-round cherry blossom trees. They are always in full bloom thanks to magic and would often shed petals into the canals of the city. Zelta Abdure was once a grand city, their buildings trimmed with gold, but now it is a ruin. Its past is only known by word as no record survived, not even saved during the evacuation from Tufia Bax. The only thing left of the city to anyone's knowledge are stone pillars and archways worn down by magic, weather, and time itself. 
Although they are true, mostly aren't homeless. There are quite a lot who like to move into abandoned buildings or are often avoided even by city guards. This is mostly due to the buildings being in such terrible condition that the floor or ceiling can crumble away at any moment. In many instances, these buildings are populated by a multitude of squatters. The strongest person, whether through magic or through physical strength, is often in charge of the facility. Unfortunately, they usually rule with an iron fist. A lot of the squatters that live in these conditions do their best to earn enough money to move into a real home. Similar to the Meiwei, Archun believe themselves to be the most intelligent, talented race and also the most important. The probability of an Archun being racist is about 50-50. Half of the Archun believe that all races are lesser and should be treated as such while the other half butt heads with them, doing what they can to show that not all Archun are racist. These same Archun who will stand by the side of other races have also been known to fall in love and have children with them. These hybrid children will sometimes be treated as second-class citizens, depending on the Archun they socialize with. Depending on their neighbors, even the parents of the hybrid child can face hardships. Even Archun children have the tendency to partake in racism, egging these families' houses and leaving nasty surprises of all kinds on their front doorstep. Similar to that of different races, riders and dragons will also be seen as either equal or lesser depending on the Archun that is asked. Riders are always seen as amazing, but 50% of the Archun population will say that dragons are beneath them, especially by the nobles. They are known to prefer talking to a rider over their dragon, often treating the dragon as non-existent. However, if a rider wasn't born to nobles, then they are often treated the same way as the dragons by the nobility of the Archun. The Archun nobility are so picky when it comes to those they socialize with that they prefer to socialize with others of nobility, or at least those who are incredibly rich with or without a nobility title, even among their own kind. Even being a rider will automatically grant a chance to even gain their attention. Even though the Archun don't have a god, they don't believe that anyone's gods actually exist. They just believe that the gods, whichever race worships them, simply exist as a tale to give their people hope or to explain the unexplained. When it comes to the unexplained, even the Archun know that the Meiwei have the answers, even though they never openly admit the Meiwei have more answers than them. When it comes to knowledge, the Archun are still pushing to surpass the Meiwei, along with any other race, but mostly against the Despite their strong dislike and often blatant racism towards the Meiwei, a lot of the Meiwei studies and experiments are taught in our Troon households. They believe the more smart the next generation of our Troon are, the higher the chances of discovering something new before the Meiwei can get to it. The one advancement they have with the Meiwei is the invention of the steam train. Just so that the Meiwei can use it, the race had offered to pay for a railroad to be built between their cities and the our Troon cities, or at least the ones on the continent of Selgamai. There are three trains in all. One runs between the Mueyan cities of Pagoma to Esfandel, bypassing Kremenos entirely. Another one runs between the Archun cities of Kaikareg and Sungay Kalopa. The third runs from the Archun city of Kaikareg to the Mueyan city of Esfandel. The social construct of Jeleni Sean leans heavily on the aspect of riches. There's a district for lower class, middle class, and upper class, and there's strikingly obvious differences between the three. Even though the middle class can travel mostly freely between the upper class and lower class districts, they will still receive sneers from upper class in their districts and looks of suspicion for their fellow middle class citizens when visiting the lower class district. The Rana district is where the lower class, or those who have barely any money to their name, or even no money at all live. It's incredibly crowded, which says a lot about their economy and how it's run. The Rana district is the outer ring of buildings within Jelene Sand, made up mostly of buildings that are too close to each other. There are no roads save for the ones in and out of the city that lead directly to the upper class district. There's barely any space between the buildings, and there are a lot of them. There's really no way for those who live in the Rana to get to the middle class district as there's a tall wall between the two to obscure the ugliness of the Rana from the middle class citizens. The only reason why anyone from middle or upper class would ever be seen in the Rana would be one of two. That they are just passing through to get outside of the city or back into the middle slash upper class districts, or because they are up to some really shady business. Great doors on four sides of the wall surrounding the Rhonda district leads directly into the Milan district. This is where the middle class live and it's an obvious upgrade from the Rana. There are actual roads in between buildings with very few alleyways as most of the buildings along a street are melted into each other, built into each other's sides. The wall in between the Milan district and the upper class district also obscures the middle class from the upper class view. Even though it's a lot nicer than the Rana district, the upper class still don't want to see it as they still consider it ugly to look at. 
However, there is a massive marketplace lining this wall, which even the upper class will sometimes attend just for amusement. The guards of Jelene Sam patrol the streets of the Milan district and try to avoid stepping into the Rana unless they're chasing a suspect. The final district is meant for the upper class and open only to those outside that they personally invite. It is known as the Ogre district. Unlike the Rana and Milan districts, this district looks like an oasis. Colorful tiling lines the roads. There's many trees and foliage lining the buildings. Fountains of many sizes in the courtyards, and there are even exotic animals walking or flying around the place. The buildings are grand, tall, colorful, lots of patterns, and many open balconies. There are sand guards stationed at every building, and in many cases outside specific rooms of the buildings, in case of emergencies, which there are, thankfully, so few of. Some of the guards are used as special bodyguards for invited guests and a handful of high-class citizens. Those who live here are quite used to this, often unintentionally ignoring the guards. The small collection of high-class citizens that don't ignore the guards are often children, who like to pull pranks and even harass guards who are on duty, especially those stationed at their houses. Magic isn't really welcome in the city of Kai Kareg. This isn't to say they're anti-magic, but they would prefer not to use it or watch it be used. This even includes enchanted items or naturally occurring magic. They can't stop magic from happening, but they will get rid of any magical flora or fauna that appears within their city. Guests of the city can carry enchanted or magical items, but cannot use them in public. These even include potions. Should a guest have a magical base animal with them, no matter what the animal is used for, they are expected to leave them at the stables just outside the city. Riders are expected not to use any kind of magic in public, and dragons are asked not to transform. Should a dragon or a rider be born within the city, their family will mostly react in one of two ways. They will allow the dragon or rider to transform while on their property, which often includes studying the usage of magic within their own bedrooms or practicing the transformation between Archoon to dragon in their backyard, often having to build incredibly high fencing to shield them from view, or the family will require them to train outside of the city. There's one particular reaction that isn't as widely seen, and that's to kick the child out of the household or even abandon the child at an orphanage outside of the city the moment they were born. There are some races that have natural magic or have come into existence because of magic. They are an exception to the rule, but only because they are beings who can communicate in the same language. However, they will be looked down upon within the city and will often face hostility from the citizens. Some examples of natural magic for races include Lindair, Zephyr, Machi, and Yangtze. Kai Kareg is where the invention of the magic study Dragon Slayer originated. It's created as anti-magic, as the citizens labeled, is therefore the only kind of magic allowed. The magic used as a dragon slayer is typically protection from magic and reversal magic, i.e. if the magic was directed at the dragon slayer, they can use a spell to bounce it back or render the spell null. The same magic study was used in mass to erase the dragon, creature, not class, from existence. Branding, a punishment Kai Kareg is well known for, has social consequences. Often those who are branded will not be hired or welcome in public establishments. Relationships can also be different difficult, whether it's familial, platonic, or romantic. Most people within the city will refuse relationships with people who are branded, especially with certain brandings representing murder, political, or sacrilegious acts. Even if the first brand is hidden, the guard will still spread the word and others will know. In the case of a more frowned upon race, those who can transform to a human-like state, or a class, dragon or rider, they will be treated more aggressively by the citizens of Kai Kareg and the guards will turn the other cheek. Within the city of Sungai Kalopa, family comes first. And those within the family that come first? The parents. An Archon's parents, whether the child is a parent themselves yet, will always be the child's priority. Pleasing them and doing as they say is the backbone of the family and the backbone of society itself. This is the reason why a lot of family members live near each other even after moving out. A lot of expectations are put on the children of Sungai Kalopa, but this doesn't stop them from reaching their dreams. Unlike what most people believe, the parents of Sungai Kalopa support their children's dreams, but most of the time they have to be convinced of the pros of reaching the dream. But no matter how busy a family in Sungai Kalopa gets, there's always time for tea. Once a day, the family members will sit down for some afternoon tea. This usually includes aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, parents, and their children, but mostly those 
those who are related by blood. Those who join through marriage usually go to their own family's tea gathering. The only exceptions to this is if their family doesn't live in Sungay Kalupa or that they are the last living member of their family. Then they are more than welcome to join their extended family for tea. After family always comes community. The city of Sungay Kalupa is in great condition, and the people of the city make sure of it. They help build new buildings together, repair old ones, clean walkways and roads, donate for new community projects, and make sure that all citizens have food and shelter, even if it's not permanent. They always greet everyone that they pass by, whether they are neighbor or traveler, and have been known to help when asked. They will sometimes even drop what they're doing, even if it's important to help others. Very little is known about how the Artrun within Zilta Abdure socialized. Most information is written within old scrolls that the Mewe have, or by word of mouth from the Artrun, passed down from generation to generation. They were, in fact, rivals with the Mewean neighbors as early as the establishment of the very city. They became very competitive with the most mundane things. Despite this, they often traded with their Mewean neighbors and even had hybrid children with them. Eventually, the two sides became so competitive that one of the sides, Artrun or Mewe, misconstrued it as an act of aggression. This started a war between the two cities. No one knows who attacked first, and in the end, it didn't matter. When the magic war began, hybrids and Mewe alike were expelled from their city. To combat the Mewean forces, any Artrun outside of the cities were requested to come back and serve time in the war. In fact, recruiters traveled between multiple Artrun cities to try and get as many Artrun soldiers for their side as possible. Rumors spread that there was no real winner of the war, as the war itself caused an anomaly known as the Great Magical Storm, which caused everyone, Artrun, Mewe, and Hybrid, to flee the continent. Whether or not they managed to get away remains a mystery. Those who left for the war and those who had originally lived in these cities had disappeared completely. Mm -hmm.